last little while, I wanted, I do want to just touch on this. We've talked about this before, and actually, people should really look up the history you and I did, produced uh, by Vic Viana of Patrice Lumumba. It's great yes. history. Please look that up. But yes. this is Patrice Lumumba's birth month. I believe he was born on the July 2nd, 1925. Just talk to us about Lumumba and his legacy for a bit. Okay, very good. And also June 30th uh, was the uh, the 60th anniversary now, yes, of Congo's independence from Belgium. Uh, yes, Patrice Lumumba. What a golden moment in Africa's history, right? In terms of the potential when Congo, that had been uh, a colony of Belgium, finally won its independence in 1960. And Congo actually had one of the most horrific experiences in terms of the history of colonial engagement, perhaps in the entire African continent, right? Where initially um, in the um, 1890s, it was first established as a private a state belonging to King Leopold II. And King Leopold imposed this genocidal regime in the Congo. At that time, the major products uh, was ivory and, and rubber. So there was a quota established. And if each village or community did not produce a certain uh, quantity to satisfy the quota, they would use some victims as examples to incentivize others. So what would they do? They would either kill, and that led to the mass extermination and the estimates, these are very difficult things, but you just know there must have been a lot of people killed when the estimates range from five to 10 million people. Let's just say at least a few millions, right? Ended up being exterminated or the others who were allowed to live as living incentive to those who were there slack and not produce their quota. They had their limbs severed. And you have these, their famous photos now in the history books. And Raul Peck also has these images in the beginning of his movie, Lumumba. Raul Peck is the Haitian filmmaker who made that film. It's a feature also film. made Young Lumumba. Marks. Right, exactly. Yeah, good. Exactly. So, yeah, he's a very interesting. And I wait, did he make I Am Not Your Negro? Yes, he did. Okay, yeah. So, he's a very yes, interesting he did. filmmaker. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, he yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he has those images too, where you have Africans holding the severed hands, and you have some, uh, the arms were cut off, some had the feet cut off, including children, right? Yep. So, it was so horrific that the, he was denounced by other European imperial powers. So these are not good people, but announcing somebody who is (laughs) even worse than that. And Mark Twain in the United States was also famous for denouncing him in uh, many of his writings. So Belgium's solution was to take uh, this free estate away, quote unquote free estate. And what was the solution to liberate it and say, Congolese, you're now free? No, the solution was to turn it into a Belgian colony, (laughs) which is what they did. And the colonial regime lasted until 1960. And then Patrice Lumumba er emerged. He was largely self-educated, but very intelligent and read a lot. And he had some mentors too, like Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, who of course was the first prime minister and then president of Ghana, which was the first uh, British uh, colony south of the Sahara to win its independence in 1956. So he got a lot of intellectual tutoring, people from like Julius Nyerere as well in Tanzania. But these countries were themselves just recently emerging from colonialism. So He was working under very difficult conditions because in the entire cabinet that he created as the first government, only a handful had college degrees, right? Why? Because Belgium had no plan of leaving the Congo and had not allowed Congolese to become educated. So they were set up to fail 
from the get-go. Congo, as you know, is one of the most wealthy countries in the world in terms of resources. It has pretty much everything. And a recent World Bank estimate, estimated the resources at almost $28 trillion with a T. And they continue to cover, to discover new resources on a yearly basis, right? So who even knows how wealthy it is, right? But at that time, the primary resource was copper. And copper was confined in what was called the Katanga region. So Belgium immediately started to promote secession after Congo won its formal independence in June, 1960. And it promoted Moist Chambe, who led his region of Katanga to secede from the rest of the Congo and financed it. And so Lumumba had no chance of succeeding because not only was he fighting against Belgium, Belgium was working in concert with the United States and with Britain. And here in the United States, uh, Eisenhower, before even Kennedy became president, had made the decision that Lumumba should be eliminated because Lumumba was, Lumumba first sought help from the United States and the United Nations to try to, uh, to put down the rebellion and the secession because he realized that if Katanga broke, other regions would break and that would be the end of the Congo, right? And when that help was not forthcoming, he uh, sought some help from the Soviet Union. And that was played out as, oh, here we are. We have another, another red uh, communist coming into leadership in the Congo. And this must be stopped at all costs. So he was prime minister only for three months. September, he was overthrown by somebody who was also supposedly his right-hand man, Joseph Mobutu, later known just by the one name, Mobutu, or Mobutu Seseko, who by that time, of course, was a, a CIA agent. And Lumumba was delivered, was humiliated. And there are those images that I can't stand to watch. No, that's disgusting, yeah. Well, after he had been captured and brought back to, uh, and also let me talk about that because this is actually true. And, you know, Peck shows a little bit of that in his film, but there's not, of course, in a feature film, you can only explore so much. But after he was overthrown, he was then, his residence was, was, uh, was secured by the United Nations soldiers. But he managed to, to escape. His supporters spirited him out of the compound. And if Lumumba only cared for Lumumba, he would have just fled the country. And that would have, he would have, who knows what might have happened, but he would have fled the country. But instead, even as he was traveling toward a region where he had the most support, he was stopping along the route and mobilizing people in their villages and communities, saying, don't worry, you know, we, they're trying to reverse our independence, but they won't succeed mobilizing, mobilizing. And we can understand that knowing the type of person Lumumba was, really connected to the grassroots, having come up from the grassroots. But perhaps that might not have been the, the best thing in his to, in order to preserve his you know, physical safety. Right. And that's how eventually uh, the folks, uh, Mobutu and, and the CIA folks caught up with him, right? And ultimately he was delivered to the person whom they knew would kill him, Moïse de Chambe, the secessionist leader in Katanga, where he was brutally tortured and then executed by firing squad. And to show to what extent people, the, the neo-colonial regime and the supporters know how, how powerful, even in death, that he would still be, right? As a legacy and a memory of what Congo could have been. His body was chopped up into pieces, <laughs> you know, by the Belgians and the, and the CIA and Chambé's folks. 
and they really, and they talk about African barbarism, right? His body was chopped up into pieces. It was burned and then dissolved in acid. So that even today in the 21st century, we can't say we can go to a, a location where Lumumba is buried and let's pay our respects to his legacy. Of course, people like Lumumba cannot be erased from history. And that is why we're still discussing him today. Uh, that is why we still discuss people like Kwame Nkrumah. That is why we still discuss people like Thomas Sankara of Burkina Faso, because these are the people that imagined a different Africa, an Africa that still resonates. And that's why young people in Africa still hold these as some of the most uh, popular figures in all of Africa's history, which you know, keeps me hopeful. I'm generally a very optimistic person anyway. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we can't help but be optimistic. And we can't help but see that people can only tolerate so much. And people at certain stages in history will always make demands that will change society. Because, you know, that is what history is all about. It's about the contradictions. And then we make change and we keep moving forward with the process of history. Milton Alamadi, we learned so much from you. I'm just honored. I, it's a pleasure. I enjoy it so much. Please tell all the ways that people can find you. Uh, and also, I, I, your new book, which I should have mentioned up top. I'm very yes. sorry. Please, okay, I, please it's, it slipped if, my if mind. People, if people want to get in a conversation, please feel free to obviously email me malimadi at gmail.com that's m-a-l-l-i-m-a-d-i at gmail.com also please visit blackstarnews.com which is the website uh, I am actually following your suggestion and I'm going to be creating a platform on Patreon great so it's going to be Patreon slash African History Club so yes this is oh this is so it. good this <laughs> is so history. I'm so excited yeah. I'm so right, excited. Thank you. thank you. Now, in terms Fantastic. of the book, yes. in terms of the book, The Hearts of Darkness, How White Writers Created the Racist Image of Africa, which, of course, is a critique of uh, the uh, representations of Africa starting in the 18th century right through to our contemporary era. And a, a lot of why I was exciting, excited by the work was also because I got to go into the archives of the New York Times, and I, I got a lot of letters exchanged between editors in New York and reporters sent to Africa. And I captured some of the ugly language that went into formulating some of the coverage of Africa. So the book, as you know, I published it from via Black Star Books. I now have a contract from a publisher. Great. In, uh, uh, it's a university press. Great. So if this goes uh, successfully and we sign the contract, then we will be discussing this book once again on your show, hopefully in the near future. Anytime. And you'll be back on TMBS soon as well. You're one of our regulars, of course, uh, Milton. And of course, please check out uh, people can find uh, even, of course, in the traditional way, but you can also listen to uh, Milton's great WBAI show online as well. Milton yes. Alamadi, thank you so thank much. You. Stay safe. Stay strong. You, be Carmen. well. Aluta continua. Stay well. Stay well. Thank you so much.